Following that brutal 2-10 and 10 campaign in 2012, it appears as though Steve Adazio has stabilized the program at Boston College with back-to-back seven-win campaigns and postseason appearances. We uh, look to Dan Rubin of VC Interruption to help us uh, break it down for 2015 with a lot of losses to talk about on offense. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, good stuff here because we've got a Boston College program that uh, is in good shape or has stabilized, as mentioned, uh, has been a strong team, 4-4 uh, four and four in the ACC last year, but that offense has been completely decimated. So let's start at quarterback where Tyler Murphy just doesn't take the, the throwing game uh, in graduation, but he takes away almost 1,200 yards in rushing as well. Yeah, you know, BC's in a tough spot this year. They, they're going to have to find a quarterback that hasn't played. Uh, it's a similar situation than what they've had a few years ago, but there's no experience. There's virtually no game experience on the roster. Uh, they only have a couple of sophomores. They had a, a redshirt freshman in there. Uh, Darius Wade played a few snaps and blowouts last year. I know he played against UMass, uh, played against Maine. Uh, nothing that really jumps off the table. So he'll have a uh, he'll have a couple. Of, uh, he'll probably get the first crack at it as the starter. Um, behind him, you have a redshirt freshman, Troy Flutie, who set every offensive record in Massachusetts. And anytime there's a Flutie on the roster at Boston College, people want him to play. Whether or not whether or not he's the best candidate, that he, he's got to go out there and prove it. But the minute you see the last name, you you expect him to get out. He's, he's get a shot. And a couple of freshmen that came in this year. I know Jeff Smith's on there. I believe Elijah Robinson's another name to keep an eye on. Uh, but, again, nobody who's actually played at the college level. So it'll be really interesting to see and watch. Yeah, for Troy, he doesn't have much stature to replace, but uh, big shoes to fill, I guess you could say. Uh, no question about that. Yes. Of uh, the only Heisman Trophy yes, in the history. Yes, big, big time. Uh, big let's time. look at the running backs. Uh, and, well, let's broaden it out to the skill position players. John Hilleman comes back after a big campaign with 13 touchdowns and 860 rushing yards. I would expect with the quarterback not being as dynamic on the edge in the in the rushing game that more is expected possibly of Hilleman, but you you seem to have a ton of running backs who are capable. Uh, at wide out, you lose uh, Josh Bordner, who caught just 27 passes, but he was a leading receiver and... Uh, Dan Crimmins is a guy that caught 25 passes last year. So size up the skill positions for us. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to watch uh, what happens at the skill positions. I know that um, when it comes down to it at the running back position, you've got four or five guys back there who can really have a good impact. Um, a guy like Marcus Outlow can back and spell Hillman. Hillman's really the bruiser back, but a guy like Outlow can get around the edge, uh, kind of get a little more speed in the backfield. Uh, Miles Willis, Tyler Rouse, those are those are similar. They've been around. They're experienced in the program. A little bit older. They 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 brought along those younger guys. Uh, you get a guy like Sherman Alston, who's a running back, but he's only about five foot seven. Uh, so he runs the jet sweep, the fly sweep around the edge. Uh, he's the type of guy that that you're never going to see coming out of the backfield because he can't take the punishment. Uh, but he's a guy that factors into the running game using some some different and weird formations that that we haven't seen in a long time, if ever, at Boston College. Uh, and really you rely on, on the different running game and the different spells and the, and the different formations in order to gloss over the fact that you haven't had a great passing game the last couple of years. Uh, Tyler Murphy was not a great passer. Uh, he, he, when trusted to throw the ball he and win the game with his arm, he couldn't. Um, he needed to be able to win the game with his legs and then set up the pass that way. Um, so you lose a tight end slash receiver like Bordner, uh, but he didn't have any wide receivers either. So you're going to have a lot of inexperience back there, and you're going to have a lot of inexperience uh, at the tight end and, and at the wide receiver position. So it's going to be really interesting to see, you get a blank slate, how do you come out and, and rebuild it from the ground up, especially when you have the plethora of running backs that you can always fall back on. And, and that's something that they'll have to figure out. It's a new offensive coordinator with Todd Fitch, uh, who's, a, who's the passing game coordinator. So he's a guy who, uh, nope, he's going to have to go to the Etch-A-Sketch and see what he can come up with. <laughs> Uh-oh, go to the Etch-A-Sketch. <laughs> All right, Dan, uh, let's look at the offensive line because aside from losing a dynamic, successful quarterback, uh, I think any coach's fear is losing an entire unit and that unit being the offensive line might be the most important unit for any team 
anywhere when you lose all the starters. And then I think Adazio made the comment uh, in the last couple of weeks that he's got like seven and a half healthy offensive linemen. It's a bit thin up front. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be really tough for the uh, for the offense uh, to break in a new line and break in the line along with uh, with everything else that they have going on. Uh, Andy Gallick is gone. He was your four year starter at center. You lose a guy like Bobby Verdaro. Um, different aspects of the offensive line in this in this blocking scheme. When you're referred to as O line U and you're referred to as a as a school that's really good with the offensive line uh, that can open up the holes and your strength is the running game, we usually rely on, on the offensive line to, to plow the road. Uh, the problem is is that you know you have all these running backs and you have an inexperienced line, you have guys who haven't played together, guys who played minimally, uh, you know, guys who only came in in injury situations. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting and, and really challenging for Boston College to, to fix that situation and fix the uh, – and, and, and get the running game going when you have a bunch of guys that haven't played, and, and we're still waiting to see who steps to the forefront on that. Dan Rubin joins us from BC Interruption. And to your point, Dan, uh, 15th in the nation in rush, rushing, 255 yards per game, and when you lose a quarterback that rushes for 1,200 yards plus the entire offensive line, that pretty much uh, puts the exclamation point uh, on your statement about uh, trying to replace uh, what Steve Adazio likes to do, and that's run the football. Defensively, very strong last year. 21st in the nation uh, points against. Uh, I, I think you're in decent shape. Yeah, it's it's gonna. They they got the good front seven. The front seven is gonna be exciting to watch. Uh, Stephen Daniels is the is the next one in terms of the uh, of the linebackers. Uh, when we talk about the linebackers out of Boston College, you hear about the Mark Herzlicks and the Luke Keekleys of the world. Uh, Steele DeVito was another name when they were when they were bad, uh, when they were losing all those games. Uh, but Stephen Daniels has really stepped to the forefront and kind of taken over the, the quarterback of the defense position, that linebacker position. You've got a really good front seven, a really good defensive line that's going to be able to get after the quarterback. Uh, which will help gloss over the fact that the, the defensive backs aren't great. Uh, the defensive backs are susceptible to the deep ball. Uh, you don't really have a number one corner. You did in, in Manny Espria, and I think Espria, if you put him on any other roster, probably wouldn't have been a number one or even a number two defensive back. Uh, so you're bringing in guys. You're, you're bringing in freshmen. Uh, there's another one, uh, Lucas Dennis, who's coming in. He's from. Uh, he's actually from Espria's uh, – Esprit is high school of Everett, Massachusetts, which is a state championship up here. Um, he's very good. He's very talented, but he's going to be very raw. He's also going to be undersized because he's only going to be a true freshman. So whether or not he plays, you know, the the secondary is going to be in some is going to be in some trouble. Hopefully, for BC's sake, the front seven you don't have to force those guys, the Dennis's, the the other true freshmen coming in into those situations, and you can allow them to develop a little bit more. Yeah, Dan, unfortunately, you're not in a fertile recruiting ground up there in the Northeast. It's tough to drag the better kids up from Florida and other places. I tell you, though, I'm amazed at what Boston College does when they're good. They've had a couple down periods, but forever, pretty much since the Flutie years, it's been a seven- to eight-win program going to, to bowl games, going to postseason play consistently. Adazio's turned it around again, and, and I'm, I'm amazed at... What, what's able to be accomplished at Boston College when you don't get the good recruits, uh, the, the, the top elite recruits, and still able to play Florida State as you have the last two years down to the wire. And uh, unfortunately, you're in that division with Louisville and Clemson and Florida State. If Boston College is in the other division in the ACC, they get a fighting chance. Oh, if they were in the Coastal, they probably have been in the ACC championship game simply because I think the Coastal last year was who wants it, who doesn't want it the worst. Or I think it was everybody spent a day or a week or two as the uh, as the first place team in the Coastal. And the Atlantic Division is so hard, especially when you're dealing with recruiting classes that you have a very different set of standards than some of the other schools. Boston College is notorious for its academics. Uh, you know, and, and that's not to say that Florida State's a, a bunch of, uh, you know, guys who are scoring low to nothing on their SATs. It's a different type of academics because Boston College prides itself on that, and the athletes do have to get in on that higher standard. Um, but for Boston College and for Steve Adazio, you have a couple of pipelines that Frank Spaziani didn't do a good job of tapping into, uh, that being the, the Catholic schools of New Jersey, the Don Bosco preps, 
the Catholic schools of Pennsylvania going into those areas. You always could get the recruits from there. They just had kind of gotten away from it for a little while and uh, really got out-recruited in their backyard, something awful for the last few years. Uh, so that's something that they're, they're building on. They're realizing that it's not a fertile ground, but you can still, if you can coach them up, get those guys who are the the three-star recruits, the the top guys in New England, build the fence around New England. And if you're bringing in a three-star guy from Massachusetts or from Connecticut, which is where Steve Adazio is from, that might equal the same as a low four-star guy from Pennsylvania or a low four-star guy from uh, from Florida or Ohio or those places that you used to go. That said, uh, Adazio has his pipelines. He's very good in Florida. He's been very good of rebuilding the home area, getting the top recruits, as opposed to going to the depth guys because there is no depth in Massachusetts at all. Um, and he's starting to expand a little bit back out into the national radar, uh, which is helping the visibility of the program, if nothing else. And, you know, for, for the deeper areas of the country, I, I have no problem getting a two-star or three-star guy from Texas if he's going to come in because his performance at a three-star level might be relative to the rest of the guys that he's around. You know, if you're getting a five-star guy from the Metroplex area, uh, the Fort Worth area, and you get a guy who's a three-star, he could be pretty darn good with the right coach. He's just going up against competition that's that much better. So you bring in these guys, you coach them up. They're raw. They all do one or two things well, but they don't do – they're not all tool guys. And, uh, you know, you can compete. And I guess that's the – that's the key is, is he's rebuilding the program. He stayed competitive almost right away. And the more you get to recruit, the more you get to coach them up, hopefully you start getting back up to the level that you were at, which is to compete with Clemson and compete with Florida State and start beating them. Very good. Boston College, uh, back-to-back seven-win campaigns. Dan Rubin with a breakdown of spring practice as uh, the Boston College Eagles uh, gear toward the spring game and then the 2015 season. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Mark. Anytime.